Aloha and welcome together to Hawaii Together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kelee Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, and just delighted to be with you today and a couple of wonderful guests. Well, it's August of 2021, and we are still in the coronavirus pandemic era. And who would have thought that it would last this long? One of the major problems that we've seen is how to balance the role of government in taking care of public health against the preservation of our personal liberties and rights. As the 2021 legislative session here in Hawaii came to a close, there were many Hawaii residents who were disappointed because the legislature failed to approve a bill that would have placed limits on the governor's emergency powers. We saw during the, the year of pandemic management that there were emergency decrees that went on perpetually, although they were limited in terms of their expiration date, so to speak, they were renewed over and over. And that left us wondering who's really in charge? Are the people or a small number of individuals, perhaps just the governor? Today, we're gonna to talk to Melissa Newsham, a researcher at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. She's going to share the results of her research into why a certain bill, the bill we're talking about, failed at the last minute to make it to the governor's desk, although there was tremendous widespread support from individuals and public interest groups for the bill, and what that means in terms of our civil liberties and our accountable government. I'm also pleased to have with us today Malia Blom-Hill, the Institute Policy Director. She's going to discuss how that bill would have limited the unchecked power of the governor. So let's go straight to our guests. First of all, Melissa, I know you've been traveling. You just got off the plane from Japan. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're glad to have you on the Grassroot Institute team. Thank you for having me. And Malia, a regular guest here on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Thanks for all the work that you do all the way from the East Coast as an expatriate of Hawaii on behalf of the Grassroot Institute managing our policy directions. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here as always. Well, going back to Melissa, tell us a little bit about your research background. I know you're at Case Western right now, uh, but in terms of the research work you do for your homeland, Hawaii, what have you been writing about at the Grassroot Institute? Sure. Well, over the last two years or so, I've had the pleasure of working at the Grassroot Institute, um, working on some govern government accountability, as well as some tourism and travel related topics, um, like the Airport Corporation, for example. Why is it important for us to, to look at different models of doing things in Hawaii? For example, look at a little more privatization in terms of the management of our airport operations. Well, I think from a personal level, I'm just one among many young people who really love Hawaii, but are kind of concerned with the direction and just the same old that's been happening. So it's been exciting to work with um, an organization like the Grassroot Institute that's um, really pushing to change that by working together across the aisle. Well, Melissa, I asked you to join us today because you've written a paper for us that we've published called Why Reform of Hawaii's Emergency Powers Laws Failed. And that's available on our website at grassrootinstitute.org. Could you give us a quick summary of that piece? You know, what, what were you writing about? Why did you write it? And, and give us a little, uh, a little glimpse in, into that paper. Sure. Well, I think many of us were optimistic about HB 103 passing and establishing some of the checks to the governor's um, executive emergency powers that we were looking for. I mean, it seemed to be making its way steadily through the legislative process, but um, it was killed at the 11th hour without much of an explanation as to what exactly happened. So um, we decided to look into that and I'll certainly go into more detail um, later on, but I guess um, a reason the reason why the bill never made it through, I think can be boiled down to disagreement over the ease with which the governor can can extend an emergency, um, as well as, I think, a degree of um, political shenanigans, you could say. But what do you, were really the, the root causes, you feel, that the bill failed? I mean, there, there was a tremendous sentiment in the public that although we recognize the role of government in managing the health crisis, we're concerned uh, about accountability. We're concerned about uh, the, the, the continued uh, extension of the emergency powers decrees, decree after decree. Uh, and there was a lot of sentiment uh, even in the legislature itself for passing that bill. Why, why do you think it, it, it failed? Uh, the title of your paper, paper is Why Reform of Hawaii's Emergency Powers Law Failed. 
Sure. Well, I think it can be explained by, I think, a disagreement between the House and the Senate with um, over how easy and um, how easily the um, the governor can extend or renew. Some people in the House felt that the, I guess, the bill as it was, was a bit too strict in, in terms of limiting in terms of um, his, the governor's ability to do that. And these, I guess, issues um, were never able to be resolved. Um, and so the bill was informally killed by um, in the end. Well, there certainly were political reasons uh, at play. M M Leah, uh, you've been watching almost all the legislature in, 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 the, in the House uh, and the Senate that has to deal with uh, civil liberties and rights and so forth. And you certainly watched HB 103. What was that bill about? You know, what was it trying to accomplish? And uh, maybe that can give us deeper insight into uh, how it was received and why it failed. Well, um, what HB 103 was trying to do was reform the emergency management uh, law, the, basically the, the Hawaii statute that gives the governor the ability to uh, pass all the executive orders, you know, declare a state of emergency, the, the entire situation under which uh, the people of Hawaii have been living for the last year plus, sort of governed by this emergency, the state of emergency, that's all defined by the Emergency Management Act. And when it was enacted, you know, I think it's enacted more with the idea of a hurricane, a temporary kind of emergency. And you can tell that it was never really intended to deal with something that would go on for months and months and months. So it has a automatic termination of 60 days. And when that termination date came and passed and the governor just extended the emergency, extended the emergency, extended the emergency, uh, things that are very much just like legislation, you know, which is not the executive's role, uh, being, being passed, um, you know, serious changes to when uh, things are due, the eviction moratorium, you know, pretty significant changes in our law. They happen through this executive order process. So, you know, the powers during an emergency are really significant, which is why we say it wasn't really intended to go for so long. So this bill was an attempt to correct that. Um, you could argue that perhaps it was um, trying to correct the, the problem that we have and yet also trying to still be address, you know, the what it was originally intended for, and that might be where the problem was, because it atten attempted to put limits on the governor's ability to extend and extend and extend an emergency. It created a way for the legislature to stop a state of emergency. It required uh, justification for suspension of laws. It created a, um, it, it emphasized the importance of any executive actions, executive orders having to align with Hawaii Constitution. A lot of these things that you know people were talking about during this state of emergency, how do we protect the people's rights? How do we get people a voice? So it attempted to address those by putting in a check on how a state of emergency, how long a state of emergency can last, and you know, trying to create some just you know, trying to force justification for suspending laws and put limits on how long a law could be suspended for. Melissa, as you were watching the bill, you noted that uh, there were ma many groups in the public that came to its defense, as well as many legislators. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, the Grassroot Institute certainly supported the bill, um, as well as Common Cause Hawaii, um, or the Civil Beat Law Center, and even the Hawaii Government Employees Association. And I think it's pretty rare to see this group of people all agree on the same bill. So I think that just speaks to um, the importance of what the bill was trying to do. Um, and on the, um, for the lawmakers, it did appear that most people supported it. It had been passed, um, I think, unanimously in the House and um, approved 23 to 2 in the Senate. So at least on the surface, it seemed like this was something that was being um, supported by um, lawmakers. I think that the fact that it got so much support, uh, public support from lawmakers as well as many organizations and groups, and then yet failed at the last minute, shows us that th this is an issue that may come back. Uh, be I think that the, the tension between the government's role in taking care of us and the government's uh, duty to give us our liberties 
is one that continues. So what do you see, Malia? I definitely hope that it is something that comes back. You know, there's a lot of ways to address the issue, but if we've learned anything, it's that the emergency management statute as it is right now is just not capable of dealing with a health emergency. Maybe the answer is to amend this, you know, is a, to a resurrection of HB 103. Maybe the answer is to uh, reform that law so that health emergencies are dealt with differently and so that you can take that out of the, the same rubric and maybe that would address the problem to some degree, but it's definitely crying out for some kind of response. Well, where did Hawaii stand? And maybe, Malia, you've looked at this across the nation uh, in terms of uh, where we are on this matter compared to other states. and. Uh, are, are there reforms being instituted around the country? There have been other states that took uh, much more aggressive action. Um, some of them early on, uh, there was uh, states where the legislature would just stepped in and uh, basically stopped the uh, state of emergency. One of the odd things is, is that the reforms that are advocated for, that we advocated for that are in HB 103, um, they do exist in, dozens of states, the ability to end the state of emergency by a concurrent resolution of the legislature. Um, that's something that is not uncommon. And so there were places where that happened. There were places where the legislature challenged the way that the executive orders happened themselves. There were states where there were lawsuits. So Hawaii, um, in its own, we're not alone in having a emergency management act like this, but there are a lot of states that have already, you know, already have it there to to address the problem differently, to have these reforms that we've been pushing for. You know, one of the things that, that we noticed early on with this bill and, and this very issue, the state's use of emergency management powers, in particular, the governor's use of emergency management powers, uh, was a difficulty in getting information. Um, it, it didn't seem to be a topic that many officials were really very open to, to talking about. And, and I'm wondering what kind of reception, Melissa, you received as, as you reached out and tried to talk to people about this. Sure. Um, well, I think one of the things that I was surprised by was just how difficult it was to get those answers from the people who supposedly supported it. Um, I reached out to the offices of or the office of the representative who introduced the bill um, to never hear back. And even when you get the answers, it's you know it can be a bit vague um, and can be difficult to put the pieces together. But um, I was able to speak to um, Senator Donna Mercado Kim, who actually opposed the bill, and she was very candid in um, expressing her reasons as to why she couldn't support it. Um, but I was, but it was a different story and for um those who at least voted in support for the bill malia is is it strange uh to see is the way hb 103 died strange or par for the course here if, if i may permit it to be gripe a little bit um it is strange uh but one of the problems i will say in having a heavily one-party legislature is that the debate doesn't happen as publicly as you might ex you might have somewhere where you know there's a lot more uh, interaction and discussion and debate through the process. So, a bill like HB 103 and there's a lot of them. They just seem like they're just they just speed through. They motor right through, and you think, okay, that's going to be fine. And when the rug gets pulled out from under them, you're left wondering. You know, was it ever intended for it to pass? Was there a lot of debate behind closed doors that we don't know about? Um, and you don't really get your answers unless you have a, someone like Melissa to go dig into it. So this was strange. It wasn't completely unheard of, but most of the time when a bill kind of just speeds through every committee like that with so much support, you just expect it to, you know, if it's going, when we were watching it, we thought the problem was going to come from the governor. We expected, you know, maybe it'll get vetoed and we'll have to advocate for a veto override. But we didn't think it would just kind of crash and burn as it came out of conference committee. That is strange. 
Well, we'll come back and talk a little bit more about this subject and, and broaden it a bit after we take a short break. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here with us. I'm Kili Akina on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. And after a short break, we'll be right back with you. Don't go away. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness. I feature a wide range of amazing guests who share valuable insights about how going beyond the lines leads to success in everything you do in life. I'm looking forward to you joining me every Monday at 11 a.m. Aloha. Well, thanks for staying around. We're at uh, we're on Hawaii together on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. I've got Melissa Newsham with us and uh, Malia Blom Hill, who are researchers at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Melissa, you know, as we've been talking about the HB 103 bill that didn't pass, although it wanted to, we wanted it to pass. We would have loved to have seen the reforms it could bring to the Emergency Powers Act. Uh, you you saw quite a bit that kind of piqued your interest and your curiosity as to how bills do pass and do fail and so forth. And there were some things that you actually wanted to make note of. Well, what were they? Sure. Well, as Malia mentioned, I, you know, it's not entirely unheard of for these kinds of bills that have widespread support to, um, to die at the last minute. But I think one of the problems was that the explanations that were given by, um, by the legislature was insufficient. Um, the Speaker of the House expressed that um, the reason why the bill failed was because after the bill came out of conference committee, they just realized that the bill didn't include a pathway for the governor to extend or renew an emergency. And um, I spoke to Representative Linda Ichiyama, who was one of the co-chairs of the conference committee on the House side as well, and she echoed that similar sentiment about um, the need for the governor to be able to extend or renew an emergency and the final version of the bill lacking that. But the interesting part is that if you look at the earlier versions of the bill um, before conference committee, they actually all included a pathway for the governor to extend an emergency. Um, it required that he request the legislature at least 12 days in advance um, to um, extend the emergency. And then the legislature then had the ability to approve the request via concurrent resolution or deny it. Um, and according to Senator Sharon Moriwaki, who I spoke to, who was um, one of the chairs of the conference committee as well, um, she expressed that it was actually the House side who um, had a problem with this, um, this the provision requiring the 12 days advance notice um, to um, request an, an extension. Um, and the House just felt that um, this was too much to ask for the governor. Um, and so they just, um, they felt the need to delete it, um, which led to some um, disagreements and that were not um, able to be resolved. So ultimately we have coming out of conference committee, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what I hear you say is it, it was a bill that no longer had a pathway for the governor to extend the emergency. Is that right? Right. Uh, and and why, why do you think that was beyond some of the po political machinations that surrounded that? What rational rationale would there be for that? Well, I mean, you know, based on what I was told, the the pathway that did exist um, required um, the concurrent, again, the 12 days advance notice and a concurrent resolution to approve it. And um, perhaps some people felt that that was just too, too strict, um, too much to ask. Um, and so it was just removed at the last minute, which led to, um, despite the fact that these concerns were not raised, um, prior to entering conference committee. Um, so I think that kind of disagreement um, probably led to um, uh, the bill failing. 
Well, let's pull out a little bit uh, from this one bill and this one issue and, and, and look overall at, at the landscape in terms of the conflict between uh, management of public health crisis and our liberties. Malia, uh, you put together for us uh, an excellent uh, white paper called Lockdowns Versus Liberty. And, and that's available at grassrootinstitute.org. Could, could you summarize what, what you were trying to say in that paper? Yeah, do we, that came out um, during the heart of the, the emergency period, not before things started opening up again. And it was, uh, we started on it in part because we had a lot of people asking, you know, why can't we just sue? You know, we've had this lot, these really heavy lockdowns. Why can't, you know, we just, you know, sue and get our rights back. And so we wanted to explain, you know, why that's not possible, um, how a court looks at these issues. And then we wanted to, you know, having done that, say, okay, but there is a problem here in the way that the emergency is conducted, um, the fact that it can go on indefinitely, the fact that we are missing some guarantees uh, our, our constitutional rights. So well, how can we improve this? How can we make our emergency statute better? How can we make it so that we don't have things happen this way again, that in the future, people have more of a voice in the conduct of an emergency, especially a health emergency. And so we looked at what reforms we would suggest when it came to uh, addressing the, the failures that we had witnessed over the course of the uh, COVID emergency. And we especially thought about, you know, how can we uh, respect the need to protect public health and public safety? Because, you know, that is still an issue. And, and yet also uh, rebalance the, the restore the balance of powers because you know over the over the last year the governor has become sort of a super legislator and that's not how our system was set up the people really have no true voice and so one of the most important things is getting the a people's voice back into the system through restoring the balance of power and creating a legislative check on the governor's uh, or the mayor's, as the case may be, powers during an emergency. So the idea of being able to end an emergency um, via concurrent resolution, which was in HB 103, was a big part of it. Um, and yes, the, the need of the governor to basically get permission, so to speak, to extend an emergency, which, by the way, as a gripe, when HB 103 went through the legislature, through the legislature for almost all of it, there was a provision that just allowed for automatic renewal of an emergency if the governor proposed it and the legislature failed to stop it. So to hear that that's the you know the lack of that when that had it, it had it for almost the entirety of the legislative session and only lost it at the very end. Um, it was the Senate that added, uh, anyway, <laughs> the process, the legislative process is a frustrating and interesting thing. But anyway, we wanted to basically create, restore the balance of powers by having the legislature have a check because that's how the people kind of get their voice in. Uh, there's a lot more responsiveness that way. So we wanted to make sure that that was there. We wanted to create more accountability. Um, we talked a lot about uh, more transparency guarantees. Uh, the governor very famously uh, suspended transparency laws, uh, sunshine and transparency laws at the beginning of the emergency. And while he did restore them to some degree, we're still not all the way back. Um, there's still a lot of foot dragging. There's still a lot of excuse making. They don't quite have to, uh, to hit the same transparency benchmarks that they had to before the uh, pandemic. So we wanted to see some kind of guarantee that sunshine laws and transparency laws would be respected. Um, we wanted uh, justification for suspension of laws, which did make it into HB 103. We wanted to see uh, a requirement that there any emergency order uh, was narrowly tailored to address the emergency uh, because some things can be very broad and that's when you start to wade into issues of rights. Uh, so a lot of these, these, these basic principles that we put forth in terms of how to reform the emergency management law with respect to constitutional principles, balance of power, transparency, and accountability. 
You know, there is often a, a rush to the courtroom in responding to infringements upon civil liberties. And yet, uh, in your paper, you make reference to the fact that you, you did take a look around at the scene nationally at many cases that were going to, tr to court and, and found that that is not a very fast solution, nor, nor a pragmatic one in, in the short run, th that in the long run, what we really have to do is change the laws. Do you exactly. want to comment on that? Yes, you know, but we, we rely very heavily on the, the idea that the courts will defend our rights and, you know, they're there as a safeguard, but um, the way that courts deal with emergencies makes it a very slow process and not necessarily successful. It's fundamentally a legislative problem. The, the way that the emergency is conducted is according to a statute, so a legislative problem has a legislative solution. The court is remedial. You know, after after your rights have been restricted, then you go to the court. But ideally, you have a situation set up where that never happens to begin with, and that requires uh, reforming the law. And that's why one of the reasons why our recommendation was we need to look at the emergency management statute, the emergency powers law, not just hope that the courts will will sweep in and help us. Uh, the the, law, the court decisions we've seen don't really show us that. And even in the best case scenario, we're just going to be litigating for months and months and months or even years. Very good. Well, Malia, thank you very much. I want to give the closing thought to over to Melissa. Uh, what would you like to see happen in this next legislative session uh, or next legislative season with respect to the emergency powers bill or act? Well, I think many of us have just been frustrated over the last year and a half or so um, with the consequences of the governor's unchecked emergency powers. But um, it's important to remember that the legislature has the ability and the responsibility to um, rein it in. And um, so far, they've kind of let us down. But um, again, like the silver lining is that um, the bill um, in the upcoming legislative session, our um, proposals can be refined um, to better reflect what it is that we're looking for. Um, and it should really be one of the priorities for the legislators. And the legislators who I had the chance to speak with all um, indicated that they were willing to re revisit this issue. So hopefully um, conversations like these and just um, providing some clarity on what exactly happened this past legislative session can kind of pave the path for resolving some of the issues that led to the bill failing. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to both of you. My guests today, Melissa Newsham and Malia Blomhill of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii have given us some wonderful insights, things to think about as we try to balance the role of government in managing public health and also defending the, our civil liberties. There's a lot of work to, ahead. I'm Kaylee Iakina on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Until next time, aloha.